Welcome to three. I'm Gil Gross with Joel Drucker and Amy Lundy. Early rounds, Australian Open, Novak Djokovic passed the test in round one over Roberto Carballas Baena. But as of recording, Rafael Nadal out at the hands of Mackie McDonald in the second round, a loss in three sets where there were um, real major health concerns after 4-3 in the second set. Nadal was down a set and a break. Joel, you wrote that Nadal's exit uh, out of this Australian Open felt a little bit different from some of the the recent uh, occasions where we've seen Nadal bow out um, even due to injury. Why did this feel different to you? I just think the accumulation, I look back as I wrote, I thought about the last year for Nadal, 2022, COVID, cracked rib, foot, abdominal, parenthood. It's a pretty busy 365 days. And then the desire to start the year fresh. And then now this, I'm just talking about this in this moment. I'm not talking about, therefore it means this, and that wave means that. I'm just talking about what that meant. And it felt it felt sad because I know, you know, we so enjoy watching Rafa play and the way he throws himself into the game. And uh, yeah, it was just sad in the second round. I mean, that's he, he, when he's had these injury things in terms, it usually doesn't happen that soon. So I found that sad. I Amy thought did. of the, the line <clears throat> from um, the Shakira song, Hips Don't Lie. <laughs> When the hip goes, it's like, oh, no, anything but the hip. Um, but that being said, Nadal, after the match, was like, yeah, I'll come back. You know, don't even, don't even um, worry about that. So I won't. I always like to listen to the player. And I know I've been harping on this confidence thing. Like, he needs confidence. He needs to get his confidence back. The injuries aside, um, and, and I found this quote from him just reading over some quotes. He actually said this before the tournament when he was asked about losing so much. And he said, it's true that I have been losing more than usual. I think I am humble enough to accept that situation. I need to build again. I need to build again this confidence with myself. So I, I, I was right. He is missing that. Um, but that being said, he's got to heal himself and, and the decision to play so much at the end of 2022, including the Paris Masters, the Tour Finals, and the big exhibition in Latin America, I think um, is is doing him no, no favors here. So um, I certainly haven't said this is the beginning of the end or writing him off or anything like that, and I don't think anyone else should either. Well, I think right now it's a it's a lose lose situation, Amy, because on one hand, in order to heal that confidence, he needs to play. And <clears throat> I mean, it's like the the continued stop start. I mean, he's missed six months in 2021. Didn't cost him at the start of 2022 because he had a great start. Now we missed six months at the end of 2022. You can't keep missing this time. It's going to catch up to you. And that's why I, I kind of agree with Joel about this feeling much more alarming than than perhaps now the foot the foot felt very alarming at rome against shapovalov so i mean th that was one of those moments where you were kind of ringing the alarm bells um but and it, then how did that work out it, it worked out that he <laughs> he the the foot he figured it out he solved the the problem so i'm i'm with you there but it's like the confidence you're right. It it's not there. It's it was it was shattered. It wasn't there against Draper. It wasn't there against McDonald. Uh, and then physically, I guess now we kind of know why. But but physically, he didn't look quick to me, um, as quick as he would need to be. And I guess that's because of the hip injury that he said he was carrying um, before it got really really bad at four three in the second set. But look, Mackie McDonald was up a set and a break, and I didn't have a good feeling about that match from Nadal's standpoint, not that he couldn't have figured it out and found a way to win it, but I didn't have a good feeling about it before the injury. Well, the physical stuff is really what matters because the confidence is the <clears throat> is a notion, is an illusion, is an attitudinal thing. And I think only Nadal is in Nadal's body. So only he knows how much he can push it, what, what where pain is and, and what that means and whether and, and 
play through it, which is kind of a silly thing. And he knows that too. And so the confidence comes from being healthy most of all. So I'm, I don't see him taking a wild card into Rotterdam in early February and, and all that. I see him just kind of like, get healthy, get healthy. That's yeah. the message. And I, and I think, um, you know, that's what matters to him. And as far as alarm, you know, what will be, will be, that's what I wrote. Like I, I, the obviously there's always talk about, well, what's the future going to be? And I, and I love the quote from Albert Einstein. I don't worry about the future. It'll be here soon enough. And I just kind of see it's this, I think in a way, I wonder if Rafa's career of injuries has always been sent here as a message to us about not thinking about the future. It's like, mm-hmm. yeah, this is part of the journey of this guy's tennis life. Who's mm-hmm. by the way, happened to win more majors than anyone ever, but this is, this comes with it too. So be it. Different than the Roger journey. The Roger journey was the rapturous ascent and the rarely injured and the resurgence and and his was his. And Novak, you know, they each had, these guys have their own paths that have come. And now part of Novak's journey is the, the preservation of his body into an advanced stage. Go ahead, Amy. Well, I just think, um, I think I, I could be mm-hmm. wrong about this, so don't light me up if I am. But I think Nadal has signed on to yet another exhibition. Vegas? He doesn't, March? Yeah, yes, Alcaraz? that's it. That's yeah, it. Um, I, I can confirm. He doesn't need the money. Um, he's hurt. If I were him, I would consider just stopping and getting ready for clay season, get, giving that a lot of thought. Um, these exhibitions are, you know, I know that, that Las Vegas, there's gotta be a lot of money involved, but you know, this is, this is a uh, legacy time. This is, uh, you're in a race with Novak Djokovic on, on grand slams. Um, I think it, you gotta be super, super smart with this stuff. The um, Las Vegas, uh, part of the Las Vegas is just before Indian Wells. So it's in that window, that period, I believe. And so he's, you know, that's a pretty, it's a pretty quick little private plane ride from Las Vegas to Indian Wells. So it's almost well, like, I think he, he should maybe consider skipping Indian Wells. Oh, you did. You ended. Yeah. You implied that yeah. I was going to ask if you think yeah. he should just kind of go, it's like a board game do, do not pass, do, do not land on, on Indian Wells. Did I saw on one site that he might even be committed to play Dubai in late February. He is. Lua Pacapulco. So um, Dubai, Indian, and Amy's suggesting, do not stop on any of those pieces. Move your piece. Go right to Monte Carlo. Go directly to Monte Carlo. But how do you get out of something like this Vegas exhibition? And and so he'll be getting on a plane and coming over to the States anyway. So, of course, he can afford to go right back. So he's fine. He's fine. And this players can afford to get like that. They can afford to get out of anything. So yeah. your your thought your thought is just move the piece. right. Go right to Monte Carlo. That's when what he could do is since there's so many like sponsor obligations and fan meet and greets at Indian Wells, what he could do is play that exhibition, do the meet and greets at Indian Wells, and then just pull out. He could do that. I should be his manager. I, 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 don't, know, I don't know the optics of that one. Amy. I, we, I think... have, we have some, right. And then, and then he could, but then, and, and that would give him the leverage to, um to fix the calendar. Yeah. I, I don't fully, I look, I, I was the one and I, I wasn't the only one on this show who thought he shouldn't play the indoor hardcore season. Right. Um, I didn't think he should. Yeah. Yeah. I, I didn't, you know, there's no, there's no major there. He's not particularly effective there. His wife just had a kid. He His ab was injured at the U.S. Open, so it was, you know, again, so it was clearly a, a stubborn injury. So, you know, there were all of these things, and he decided to play it anyway. Nadal feels like if he stops playing, uh, there's going to be an issue with his level when he comes back. And he actually, he did say that in, in this press conference once again. He said, you know, the the, the trouble is I hadn't played much for a a long time and now if i'm out again it's going to be hard to basically play at the highest level that i'm capable of when i come back so that we're in this uh we're in this bad cycle right now where there is a balance between you got to play or you're going to suffer when you come back in terms of level Uh, but you also need to get healthy yeah it's a tough place to be 
it's a tough place to be. But I think I think also um, uh, he also has an obligation to the tour. I think he feels that at times. And so that's why he played the year end championships. But he knew he was going to play that. He probably should have played a tournament before. So, boom, there's Paris indoor. There's year end. Yeah. Uh, we don't know what the severity of this uh, hip flexor injury is also. I mean, it, it could be actually a very minor injury um, for all we know. Um, what did we – let's talk about the tennis. Um, so we've talked about kind of the predicament he's in, big picture with his career. Um, actually, one more question on this. So, Amy, you're not really thinking about the retirement thing right now. I'm not either. Um, Joel, are you? I never think about that. Okay. So we're all on the same page there. You know me. My I concern, don't until, yeah, until yeah. the player says. Exactly. There's, there's no, there's no reason to right now, really. It's completely speculative too. Um, so my, my concern though is, is the level. Like, I just think there might be a level problem with Nadal if he can't stay on the court for an extended period of time. I'm reaching Yeah, that's the a level problem. That's definitely yeah. a level problem. Yeah. yeah. So, so with that said, he plays a first round match against Draper we get to see him play this match against Mackie McDonald. He's lost seven of his last nine matches. What what are you seeing out of Nadal's tennis right now, Amy? Lack of depth um, and, and maybe even pain, um, you know, going around on the, he said it was on the backhand, but the forehand didn't look good either. Um, Mackie was moving really well and getting very good depth on his ground strokes and, and not hitting the ball out, keeping the ball in the court. So I, you know, I don't want to take anything away from McDonald. He played a great match. He, he played the hand that was dealt him and he played it very well. You know, I think with the, um, Nadal, look, the whole movement, it's like, it's, it's like, it's, you watch parts of his game come apart in strands, you know, it's like the ab, we talk about the serve. So now you can't start the point on favorable terms. And then if it's the backhand, if if the weak side, if the weaker, the lesser side somewhat is not doing as much for you, then you feel the need to overplay the other side. And I think the whole the whole role of movement in this game for all players is is just so important. And so Nadal, that swarming quality he has, I mean, you could see that particularly from the second set on. I mean, he's letting balls just go and Mackie was playing smart had a good game plan was executing was keep getting some good air on his forehand which is sometimes a, a challenge for him you know it wasn't flying some good top spin and direction and and then hustling himself i mean he knew that rafa once rafa was hurt he was lashing out even more to shorten the points and uh just had to kind of stay on it but uh yeah the level problem tennis yeah that's yeah. that's that could be a big problem <laughs> He he was hitting the ball better in Nadal after the injury, because I think well, he, he had to. Right? He, felt he, well, had to. he had to. But also, had to. don't you think he detached his mind from the outcome? He no longer felt any tension because he he accepted that he lost. That he was on what we call I call that death row tennis. You're just death kind row of like, tennis. Yeah, you're, very you're good. Kind of swinging, kind of swinging freely, but also I think he felt the need, like I gotta just I gotta just swing bigger here. I can't afford a, a seven ball rally. I got to like if there's if there's the slightest scintilla, it's like uh, it's like I I know like okay whatever it is I'm gonna come in you know like the way I like I like to play not to compare to Nadal but it's like okay anyone on the court if there's a chance to kind of chip and run forward I'm gonna run forward so Nadal here lash this forehand let's why not and he connects he's Nadal he's great yeah. Um... He exactly like he flashed his racket skills and his t hand talent. How about in, that in shot? He hit. How about that shot he hit at uh, in the last game? Mackie's serving for it at six five thirty love, and he hits this kind of Mackie hits this kind of drop shot. And Adele comes in with a little little flick forehand cross court. He just kind of he looked like John McEnroe. With yeah, that shot. yeah. Like, yeah. Like, uh -huh. At a certain point, at a certain point, Nadal was hitting or or the way he was still hitting some overheads. I thought. Is this is this a is this a pro am? Are you just kind of showing us some skills here? Yeah, that's what it seemed like. I do want to also talk about uh, another pattern that I think we we keep seeing over the course of this uh, of these matches. Uh, Nadal just not really uh, adjusting the conditions all that well. Where uh, this court, even when it's when it was hot and the roof was open, it was low bouncing, and and players have been remarking about 
you know, how especially once the balls have been played with a little bit, you're, you're really losing the bounce. It's pretty dead bounce. And these are new Dunlop balls this year. Now the roof is closed. You have cool conditions. Ball starts bouncing really low. And Nadal's still playing heavy topspin. Not, mm -hmm. And Mackie's playing flat through the court. Mackie's hitting a much, much, much better ball in these conditions. And then when it came to the battle of the strike zones, and I had a coach who looked at tennis um, through the scope of contact points and protecting your contact point. Nadal, if you just looked at the contact points, it was out of his strike zone every time because of McDonald's low and flat ground stroke. Nadal's heavy spin on this court wasn't getting over the strike zone. It was going right into the strike zone. Mm -hmm. So McDonald, it was strike zone, strike zone, strike zone. Nadal, it was below the knees, below the knees, below the knees. And it just felt like a, a total mismatch in that respect. And by the way, Jack Draper has an even worse problem than Nadal when it comes to just the heavy spin on the forehand. And his forehand was ineffective compared to Nadal. So you really saw the flat hitting, I think, uh, become a key. Remember when we talked about the balls? Um, I texted a friend of mine down there, and they said that all the players are complaining about the balls, that they're soft. Mm -hmm. And and we talked about, oh, in the past, the Dunlop ball has been like a pellet. Not so this year. Interesting. And that's really interesting about the strike zone. By the way, the pro -am stuff. I didn't mean to think that Rafa was playing a pro am versus Mackie McDonald. I mean, he was just like suddenly like trotting out shots because he was so handy, hobbled, he was so hobbled that he, then he needed to just shot make. He needed to go into shot make mode instead of just grind mode, which is his his preferred mode, I think, of just kind of like, yeah, sure. You want eight, you want 10, you want 14. Let's let's go for a while, Nadal. He can do that. And uh, yeah, that's really interesting stuff about the the balls and the surface and the indoor. Those are part of the things that make tennis so unique, right? Because And then Melbourne, the whole four seasons in a day. Um, yes. mm -hmm. All of that. Well, um, let's see what happens with Nadal and, and his schedule. I'm assuming we're not going to hear anything for a long time. Um, moving on to Novak Djokovic. Um, by the way, low bouncing conditions, I have always said, is uh, probably more important for Novak than the speed of the court. I, I think he excels um, in low bouncing conditions. He's able to stay on top of the baseline. Uh, the ball doesn't get up high on him as much, which I, I think is is great for him. Anyway, uh, Amy, what do you think of his match against Roberto Carballas Baena? The guy, Novak, he's cracking the ball, guys. Uh, I didn't even have to look up the speeds, and, and somebody else can look them up if they want to. The forehand. He was hitting the forehand in that match faster than I've seen him hit it in quite some time, maybe ever. Serve, serving brilliantly, beautifully, um, hitting spots. Great speed and power on the serve. Um, so remember we talked about how he gained some weight and muscle and we talked about lead tape of the body. I think what we have here is a strategy and, and it's not just because he has an injured hamstring. I think this strategy to really crack the ball must go back to the off season. Why would he do this? Because he was, you know, doing absolutely fine when he played in 2022. Why would he put on muscle and why would he just start cracking the ball? Um, I, maybe it goes back to the losses last year to Alcaraz and Runa, the young guys. Maybe he feels like he has to make a chess move in some way to uh, rise to the occasion and take him to the, the next elevated level. I, that's great. I would agree with that because he's seeing it's like a series of software upgrades. And here come these new guys with the new operating system at a different speed. And he goes, I'm not, I got to, I got to do something. I'm not going to, and, and, and you, and you do this analysis of the, of the toolbox and the tool, yeah. Okay. Get stronger, hit harder. It's, it's not going to be tactical um, breadth. It's not, yeah, I'm going to, now I'll become a servant volleyer. That's, I mean, that worked, that he did that, that worked in that match in 2021 against Medvedev, Paris. Okay, love that. But then it's like, hmm, what more that I can control can I make yet better? Oh, I can make my already great ground strokes more forceful. I think that's a great call, Amy. And when you mention those younger players who beat him, the teenagers, it's like, 
hmm, how am I gonna how am I gonna stay ahead of these teenagers who because they're only going this way? Mm-hmm. Novak's body as great as it is, he is 35. So okay, what do I do? That's a great call. Put in some reinvest in the in the in the factory a little bit more. I'd suggest that there's a chance we're guilty of overthinking a little bit. Everybody wants to hit the ball bigger and harder. Right, but how do they take steps? Gaining 15, 10 to 15 pounds, though. I mean, that's not, this is a guy who is obsessive about what he eats and what he puts in his body. He had to have done that by design. Of course. The question is why? And then put that together with what I saw in this first match. And I, you know, there were, there was some speculation on Twitter. Well, yeah, he's hitting the ball harder because he's got a hamstring injury and he, he has to shorten the rallies. Um, that's possible that, but I'm proffering another theory here. I think your theory is more about a strategy than a tactic. If it was a hamstring, that's like a, uh, yeah, in the momentary, this is what I got to do. Cause I'm hurt similar to what we talked about with Nadal and the hip injury. Okay. I've got this injury. I got to deal with it in the moment, but Novak is such a, a long-term thinker about his game and looking down the road and thinking he's almost got to store muscle mass or build muscle mass so that when he plays Alcaraz in Rome five months from now, he's got a reserve to to draw on, perhaps. Uh, I think that's kind of it. I wonder, I'd be curious to know, um, how does a world-class athlete who wants to add muscle, how do you gain that weight? You know, did he eat a lot of ice cream? How do you do that? <laughs> sure, yeah, 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 you More start, carbs. No, you start lifting heavy. I don't think I don't think that was ever a part of uh, of and I forget where I heard it. It's so vague in my mind now or, or uh, distant. But uh, yeah, I mean, a lot of tennis players don't lift heavy and some do. I right. Think there's a there's well, a Agassi went through a period where he did and then he didn't. And there's all sorts of dialogue about this. There's a period when Agassi was about 18, 19, where he needed. I got to bulk up if I got to hang with the great Yvonne Lenzel. That's what I got to do. And he became bigger. And then you got, I got, no, I got to lean down. So mm-hmm. can you, can you gain that much muscle weight in that short a period of time? Sure. Oh yeah. But, oh, but yeah. also yeah. by the way, you can't, you can't just lift. You have to eat. Yeah. You got to lift and eat. Um, yeah. All I'm saying. Noted. Noted. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> eight pounds right there. Eight pounds. Yeah. I'm ready for <laughs> it's, the girl. it's a start. <laughs> 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 yeah, I got the I got the bench. I'm gonna get rid of those media guys and get a bench press. <laughs> well, look, we we've seen Novak um, beef up the the serve plus one play even prior to 2023, and uh, perhaps he I, I'm sure he's dug into well, how do I manage an aging body and make it so that you know it it plays to my advantage, and is my body continuing to fit the play style that I want to execute. And once the answer becomes no, well, let's, let's give a little body transformation. All the only area I'm pushing back on is I think we're giving Alcaraz and Runa probably a bit too much credit for what, for, for Novak hitting the ball big, just because I think, you know, nobody, nobody signs up for hitting an 80 mile per hour forehand over hitting an 82 mile per hour forehand. Right, but with Novak, it's all there's the, what I, one of the things I love about Novak is his always is there's this intentionality his whole life. I always go back to the picture of Novak as a five year old when he went to that. You've seen that when he goes to the practice court and he's all he's all organized. You know, I could just see if Novak Novak would be he'd be great in our world because I could see him always having his stuff together. He'd have his pens, he'd have his cards. He he's just he's that kind of way in a way different than our um than our other. They have their ways. They have their ways, but Novak, it's like he's so that discipline. And I think there's a great story to be done about the connection between the Novak off-court activities, food, fitness, and how they then connect to the tennis stuff. Because that's, you know, because that's 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 a different thing. Usually the players they don't always do that. Well, Martina did sort of in parallel with each other, but it's very interesting how that's happened with him over this last what, 12 years now, 14 years? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so the hamstring injury, which we we have alluded to but haven't dug into, as good as he looked on the court against Carbias Baena, winning in straight sets, winning the third set six love, uh, you know, the some of the signs surrounding that have actually been kind of concerning. Novak compared his injury to the uh the oblique tear in twenty twenty one. 
He has missed practice. He has heavy strapping on the leg. What are we to make of all of this? Because even though the on-court product looked pretty good, there are some concerning signs. Well, have you ever tried to launch into a new, you know, exercise program only to injure yourself? You know, like gaining 10 to 15 pounds is no small thing. I mean, and as we've described, you have to lift a lot to do it. So um, it's a lot of weight in a short amount of time. It does put him at risk for an injury. But um, the oblique tear, um, he, he managed to get through that, didn't he? So if, if this is equivalent to that, um, I think he's probably going to be okay. It probably helps that just these first few matches don't appear to be huge challenges for him. To answer your question, Amy, yes, um, when the pandemic started and we were all completely isolated and so my tennis club was closed and all this and what to do for exercise, I, I bought an exercise bike, but I said, oh, hey, I'll do a little running. I ran, around, I ran like about a quarter mile running through my parking lot, tweak, calf, you know, yeah. it's like, oh. and so- Okay, granted, I'm 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 a civilian, so yeah, Novak is a freaking a Lamborghini, and yet I'm sure it concerns him to think, wait, I do this and then I got that, and I guess we just got to kind of see and and monitor. And I think also these folks, someone told me every world class athlete is kind of always hurt to mm -hmm. some to some degree. So we'll see. I guess he'll see too. You know, are you just are, are you just one? drop shot or shot hit behind you away from, you know, hamstrings. It's just, I, I don't know. Fortunately though, he has the, you know, greatest pit crew imaginable. Yeah. <laughs> It'll also be interesting, Amy, to your point of uh, if, you know, what we see a matchup look like, you know, against somebody who is going to push Novak with weapons, uh, make him move violently on the court. Roberto Carbias Baena, not a great candidate to do that. I'm not so sure about Enzo Cuoco um, in this in this next round. Uh, world number 191 qualified. Uh, I'm not I'm not entirely sure what kind of style uh, he's going to bring to this matchup. But um, definitely, if you're looking to dictate play, play on your own terms, a matchup against Carbias Baena is going to allow you to do that if you so choose. The current the next player plays is a question of what he decides to also do against someone as accomplishes Novak. So he says, okay, I'm 191. I'm taking some cuts. I'm swinging some shots. I'm hitting here. I'm going down the line early in the points. And Novak, who is this guy? <laughs> and that could be interesting. Or or is he kind of like Novak, as he's done so often, I'll take his measure. I'll weather the storm. You don't really have that shot. Okay, let's get back to the, let's get back to the to business here. Thank you. Okay. What's cool is that he can win in any number of ways. He can defend. He was in the his first round match. He was even pulling out the serve and volley almost to make sure, OK, yeah, I still got this if I need it. Drop shots. You know, he was playing around with his whole arsenal. So as much as he was cracking the ball, um, he, he can win that way, but he doesn't have to. Absolutely. Uh, we will continue to uh, follow his run um, going into this second round matchup. And uh, we'll talk to you soon. Djokovic uh, continuing on at the Australian Open. Nadal out in the second round against Mackie McDonald with some health concerns once again. That'll do it for this episode of three. Remember, we're available on all podcast platforms. We appreciate it if you leave a rating and review on Apple and Spotify. And if you're watching on YouTube, Please like, comment, and subscribe. We will see you next time on the next episode of 3.